And that was a big issue when I first started the manufacturing process because you have a lot of people who use other people's pictures. Mm -hmm. If you go on AliExpress yeah. right now, I can comfortably say 15% of those images are mine. Are you serious? Yes. I see it all the time where I no longer trust manufacturers. If I go through your catalog and see my image, I'm like, oh, right. yeah, no, you're lying. If you're a jewelry lover and have ever considered creating your own line of custom made jewelry, this is going to be a great episode for you. Today's guest, Maya Porter Rial, just two years ago, started her own jewelry line. And she's gone from zero to $472,000 made in 2021. So for this episode, she is giving us a detailed breakdown of how she was able to accomplish that from her manufacturers to designing the jewelry to all the ups and downs she's gone through working with influencers running ads the conversation was a great one so take out your notebook and let's get into this but before we do that don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss our next conversation if you're new here hi my name is sewa and welcome to another episode of the she's off script podcast where we help you create your own unique blueprint for business success all right let's dive into the conversation maya porterial welcome to she's off script thank you for being here Thank you for having me. I'm excited. So for anyone who hasn't come across you before, could you share who you are and what you do? Yes. My name is Maya Portoriel and I'm the owner of Kitten Co. Jewelry. We specialize in 925 sterling silver fashion jewelry for women with sensitive skin. So let's start from the end. I don't think we typically do that here, but mm -hmm. I read that you went from making $500 in sales four months in to then at the end of 2019, you were already at $250,000. Is that right? Yep. And then yep. by 2021, you were at $472,000. Yes. What do you think were the keys to that rapid growth? The keys to those growth was definitely Facebook ads and influencer marketing. I think that helped me really just jump um, in my sales re revenue. Because when I was trying to do organic, I was having a really hard time passing 10,000 mm. because to pass 10,000 organically is so much manpower and legwork. And I obviously just starting out couldn't afford to, you know, have people help me create content and post and, mm -hmm. you know, just kind of be super, super active. So I think um, building essentially an army base through influencers and having ads consistently get back in front of my audience really helped me grow quickly. Plus, this was a side hustle when you first started, yeah. right? So it's important yeah. that we we note that. But I also heard that you wanted to be a fashion designer. So why did you decide to choose jewelry as your side hustle? So my first love was fashion. I always loved clothing. I always loved styling. But it's actually a really expensive industry to get your to get into. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that people don't know that go into fashion in terms of like having patterns made, you know, getting the wholesale fabric, having the CAD files to send to your manufacturer. It was just a lot of work that I didn't prepare for and I couldn't afford to uphold. Mm. Yeah. So after a couple of years of battling, trying to get small rounds of production made, I didn't realize I was always into jewelry, mainly because I couldn't wear anything. Everywhere I went, jewelry was brass or copper, solid, or just like an alloy mixed metal. Mm. When I was younger, the biggest brand they had was Claire's. And I remember that, the yeah. 10 for 10 deal. <laughs> never, <laughs> My yeah. sisters and I you know? would go there. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think Claire's served me well until I hit about 12, mm -hmm. you know, and then you're just like, the plastic beads just really aren't for me. Right. I'm just over it. So I didn't realize I always loved jewelry but could never get into it because the only sterling silver I seen was at Macy's. And I didn't want some of those, you know, older, um, like statement necklaces. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it just wasn't mm -hmm. my, it wasn't my vibe. Yeah. Um, so I didn't know that sterling silver was the answer for me when I was younger, but I always worked in jewelry. I had an internship in jewelry that I really loved. And she did sterling silver, but she was more of a luxury 
market. So I just never saw myself. I think when I had that internship, the cheapest thing she had was like four hundred dollars. Mm, that's like now, Tiffany's. That's yeah. like Tiffany's level then. Mm-hmm. Yes, and Tiffany's doing a four hundred dollar keychain. They're not right. even giving you jewelry. <laughs> yeah, it's just a keychain with Tiffany's. So yeah, so I had an internship, and she was very expensive. And then I got a job in a jewelry store in Soho, and the cheapest thing she had, she was only doing. Um, 14, 18 karat gold. Ooh. So I yeah. can't afford that. I mm. can't even visualize what that world would be like. And the only time she did sterling silver were just stoneless hoops. And even those she would charge $120 for, and they were the thinnest. Yeah. The, you know, right. So love- but what's your demographic just to get, give us a picture of who this is and what potentially they could afford. Right. Well, I think my, audience is more psychographics versus demographics. I realized there are a lot of people when the ages just really vary. It's more of the mental state of jewelry being expressive, Mm. jewelry being fun, having that sensitive skin issue. Because if you, if, if you can wear brass, I mean, like go to the beauty supply store, like Mm -hmm. why not? It's not going to last. It's going to fall apart in 20 seconds. But if you can do it, you know, for me, I never could. So for me, I think it's more of a psychological. It's people who always love jewelry, but maybe could never play in that realm. And it's also about, I, I think my customer, you just care about your visual. You care about what your clothes say about you, what your hair mm-hmm. says about you. My fault, my customers or followers, they have a hard stance on what makeup brands they like and why it's, it's a very connected being with self visually, not Mm. in a vain way, but just more. So I know what I like, I know what works for me. And I think it's more toward that versus demographic because I have customers who are 18. I have customers who are 54. I have customers who are in the Philippines and then I have customers who are in Detroit. Mm. I have a lot of my customers are corporate people or they're influencers who I didn't even know they were influenced at first, who their whole existence is style and aesthetic and fashion. So it's definitely psychographic. Mm, it just shows that your pieces are really versatile, that people can yeah. wear them to work or wear them out exactly. afterwards. But so at the time you were working on building the jewelry business, then you were working retail in New York City, earning $45,000. Now, I have to ask, how much were you able to invest in order to start the jewelry business? Because already you found out that it was expensive to start in the fashion side. Right. The way I entered jewelry was a bit different Mm -hmm. from how I even imagined entering into into fashion. When I was doing when I was doing fashion, I wanted everything to be exactly what I made custom to me because I have sensitive skin issues, which is more expensive. But when it came to jewelry, I found a lot of wholesalers who I really loved, who had great pieces that spoke to me. So I was able to enter the market at a lower price point. So when I first started, I only had to spend I wouldn't say maybe $800 with my first couple of vendors. I believe each of them were $100 each. Mm -hmm. And from there, I found the vendor that I liked the most, who their aesthetic resonated with me. And they would let me play around a bit more with with the pricing and also with like the creativity of the piece. So it was a very, very easy entry point for me because Mm -hmm. I wasn't hell bent on having to custom design every little bit of the jewelry just to get in the gate. Okay. So you started with wholesalers, meaning that they Mm -hmm. had existing pieces that they were selling to you at a lower price point. At what point did you then start to make custom jewelry? Once I really realized that there was a need, because again, I'm telling you, my sales went from zero to a hundred, literally. And once I realized there was a need, my local vendors could no longer support the demand. You know, they would only have 40 pieces on hand and that was a month Mm. that was gone. You didn't want to be limited by them. Exactly. Exactly. So I was essentially forced to expand into the manufacturing process, which I loved because then I could be more playful. 
And then I could, you know, have all the jewelry stamped kit and co. And I could really make my Mm. mark on my piece. But that was, I would say, maybe eight months in. Wow. Pretty fast. Mm -hmm. So how did you find your manufacturers then? It was a process. It was hard. It was very hard. It was very hard because sometimes the issue you have with overseas manufacturers language barrier wasn't much of a thing but it's sometimes it's just people like to tell you what you want to hear mm. it doesn't always mean that in order to get your business mm-hmm. mm. yes so it took me a few tries to find a manufacturer who said it was sterling silver and it actually was there were many times where i would get something i can just tell by the weight like this is not even silver mm. like, i don't know what this is which is not silver or because I'm my customer, I would put the necklace on. My neck would start to itch. That's obviously not silver, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And I was having a couple of experiences with that. So it took me a minute to really find a good manufacturer who I didn't have to, I didn't have to nitpick and check. I could trust them Mm -hmm. and know that they were going to give me what they asked for. And also that whenever I saw an image, the product looked exactly the same. There are many times you order something and you're like, what is this? Right. You know, that is not what I asked That's like for. a meme, what I ordered versus what I got. What right. I got, exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And that was a big issue when I first started the manufacturing process because you have a lot of people who use other people's pictures. Mm. If you go on AliExpress yeah. right now, I can comfortably say 15% of those images are mine. Are you serious? Yes. I see it all the time where I no longer trust manufacturers. If I go through your catalog and see my image, I'm like, oh, you're lying. But wait a minute. Could Could it be that they are also selling your originals to other people? Because I hear that's an issue where they they steal, quote unquote, your designs. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, yes. Or sometimes in jewelry, there's a fine line between stealing because everyone has a two millimeter tennis necklace. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a Cuban chain link. So they're inspired by you, but it could be exactly the same thing. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. So there's levels to that, but it definitely gets finicky when I Mm. see my products on companies I don't work with. And that just makes me skeptical because it's just, how can I trust you if you're already lying? And I know that's Mm -hmm. mine. I know that's my hand. I can tell. Yeah. (laughs) I know I've seen them do it in the hair industry, but interesting. They're also doing it with Mm -hmm. jewelry, but that just speaks to the level of quality that you have, your photography, your imagery. It's on point enough for them to want to use it. Right. Right. Um, but once you found your first manufacturer, it sounds like mm-hmm. there was a little bit of back and forth before you figured out that, okay, this is the one I want to work with. Now, if mm-hmm. you were to go back and do it all over again, what would you do to make sure that the process was more seamless? I think this is for the people who are thinking about going the manufacturing route. What I would do, I mean, if I'm being completely honest, mm-hmm. I, if I was starting completely from scratch, mm-hmm. I would still go through the process of the local vendors until I grew into that manufacturing because the minimums are just completely different. Mm. A local manufacturer, you can get an order between a hundred and three hundred dollars at a time. When you're overseas, you have to get a minimum between 30 and 50 pieces each size. So that means every style, like every ring I get, I have to get at least 200. There Mm. is no minimum. There there is no below 200. So if you're completely fresh, I would say definitely try to find local companies um, with a lower entry point. But if you're at the point where it's time to manufacture, I would say find 10 companies and order samples from each of them at the same time. Don't wait for one person to get back to you and Mm. see and the... Literally just do the 10 and it's hard to find 10. So if you could find 10, you did a good job. It's hard to find 10 good vendors wow, with wow. like aesthetic that 
fits you because the other thing you want to look for is your manufacturer should already be making things similar to what you want to sell. Yeah, because the machine capability, all that needs yes. to be there, the know-how. So yes. where are you looking for these 10 manufacturers? Where am I looking? Alibaba.com okay. is hands down, I think, the best situation because there's a lot of per- protection through the Alibaba platform. Also, you have a lot of English speaking manufacturers, so it's very easy to communicate. Mm. And also they have their whole catalog. It's pretty much like a mini online store. You can you can just see what you like, what the price is, how long you don't have to really ask questions initially. Mm-hmm. You can kind of get a good scope of what the company is about. Alibaba shows you how much that company made this year. And so so you can literally see. This company only made 10,000. Um, they have 70% on time delivery rate. Probably not going to go there. Mm-hmm. This company has made 2 million and they have a 98% on time rate. I'm going to try that company. And then, so you kind of have a little bit more visual data mm-hmm. on these overseas manufacturers that you wouldn't necessarily have if you just Google Chinese manufacturers. Right. Are there reviews as well so, to see how their past relationships have gone? Um, yes and no. A lot of times people don't like for me, for example, I don't like to leave public reviews because it tells you my company's information and you have a lot of competitors who will just use that manufacturer because you use them. Mm. Um, so the review thing could be difficult. You're going to get a lot of one-time purchasing people. What I like to pay attention to is their on-time delivery rate, which whenever you place an order, Alibaba will ask you, hey, was this delivered on time? Was this not delivered on time? Did you get everything you ordered? Like They'll ask you those questions and then create data based on your answer without you having to put your company information mm. on the platform. Mm-hmm. And also the good thing about Alibaba is they're very transparent with what the company is actually doing. So you'll see, so you'll see the red flags in terms of some companies have no revenue, which means they're either brand new or, but even mm. brand new is like, skeptical because right. even if you're brand new to Alibaba, you may still have clients that you've known who now just purchase through the portal. Right. So it's a little, mm, a little or bit you might, right. Mm. Or you might see that they have a 10% on time delivery or you, or it'll say their response time takes 48 hours. Like no, that. You, no. You can see the red flags right. if you're paying attention. So you said something that's interesting. And I think mm-hmm. when people are new, they want to know verbatim, step-by-step step, what you've done. And one of the questions right. I hear people asking is, well, who's your manufacturer? Why won't you share that with me? Yes. Right. I mean, yeah. just because they're working for you doesn't mean there's no room for me. So could you maybe right. share a little bit about your thought process around being protective about the name of your manufacturers? So I'm very transparent with teaching you how to do it. Like I'll help you and like, I won't do it for you, but mm-hmm. I'll guide you. I'll give you the process. But my issue when it comes to manufacturers and giving you my manufacturer is not that they don't have time for both of us. I have experienced where in Chinese culture, because my manufacturer is Chinese, they take a lot of they take a lot of pride in the recommendation and they they take it very seriously. So mm. if I tell someone, oh, hey, this is my manufacturer and they go, oh, Maya from Kit and Co, they're reaching out to me like, thank you so much. For that. Like they're taking that in a different way. Mm-hmm. So if you, if you burn my mm-hmm. manufacturer, that relays on me directly. Mm-hmm. They're like, Hey Maya, like what's, what's going on with your, like, how come they haven't, what's going And I don't know how everyone does business. I, I've, right. I've worked with them for a very long time. It's very cool. I pay on time. They deliver on time. We have no issues. Mm-hmm. They send me Christmas gifts and, and Thanksgiving gifts. I send them Chinese new year gifts. Like we don't have problems. Mm-hmm. So I get weird about people sometimes are so quick just to jump the gun 
And when you're first learning, you're making a lot of mistakes. I just don't need you to burn my bridge Mm. without me knowing you're burning it. Mm -hmm. If I'm just being completely honest. Now, I, as I've grown, have had other manufacturers who are smaller. I give those out. I'm no longer working with them. So that's completely fine. So however you go about your business is one thing. But if it's something I, if someone I'm actively working with, I'm just, I'm not comfortable giving you my exact manufacturer. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate you sharing your thought process there because someone may be like, no, I'm just going to share it with my friend, not realizing that this could impact you severely if they feel like "Mm, you're bringing us business that is kind of shady. Is this how you are too? Right. Yeah, that's yes. And that's, it's also, I mean, we do it. Think of the times where, you know, you'll have a dinner, right? Mm. And someone brings a friend, friends throwing up in your bathroom. You're like, hold on. Right. Who's this? Who is, what's going on? <laughs> who are you? <laughs> Literally, who are you and mm-hmm. what are you doing? And we've all had those experiences where, you know, you ask your friend, like, why'd you, that's what you hang with on? Right. Okay. Listen, love you, girl, but don't bring her to my house again. No problem. Right. And that's kind of how that is. Mm-hmm. Because then the issue is the next time she wants to bring a friend, you're like, wait, which does she, from where you, you're mm-hmm. a little skeptical. Mm-hmm. And to me, anyone I know who I completely trust and know they'll handle it correctly, I've given them my connection. But that's only because I trust you and I know you're going to handle this in an appropriate manner mm-hmm. and it's not going to backfire on all of us. Exactly. So it's not a hundred percent. No, it's just really be discerning about who you're sharing it with. Mm. Yes. And then also I've had a situation where someone like would literally ask my manufacturer, like, can you send me the kit and co line sheet? And they're like, they've said to me, are they in your company? Cause why they ask this information? I'm like, Oh, okay. We're going to learn my lesson. No, thank you. You can't just produce what I'm producing. Oh my God. You know, do your mm-hmm. own work. <laughs> a, a, a little bit, please, you know. Oh, but wow. It is what so, it is. So talking about line sheets, mm-hmm. I think I'd also seen that early on, you felt like you were underpricing yourself. So you had yes. started custom manufacturing with one ring and it was costing you $7 to make, but you were selling it for eighteen ninety nine. So why right. did you feel like you were underpricing and how do you approach pricing now? Well, initially... I was more concerned about being affordable, being affordable, being affordable, which I still am. But then you do have to pay attention to what the market is doing, because then you look kind of sketchy. If everyone else is charging 50 and you're charging 18.99, I don't really trust that your offer is real. I don't mm. trust that I'm going to get it. It might be a scam. I don't trust that it's real sterling silver. Because the market has determined that these are the price ranges. And I was realizing that I was having a, not a hard time selling, but a lot more questions. People would literally ask me, is this a scam? Mm, Am I going to get my Why is it so package? cheap? Oh, yeah, gosh. They were mm-hmm. a bit skeptical because the offer was bizarrely too good to be true. And we've all been burned yeah. by about situations. So once I started pricing a little bit higher and figuring out a better margin or what will be considered a margin in the jewelry industry, every industry has their own profit margins. Mm -hmm. So that's also the margin for the jewelry industry. It really depends. It could be between 75% to 110. Let where's my sketch pad? (laughs) Let me start making Mm -hmm. some jewelry. What? Yep. Wow. It's a nice little so nice pocket. Is this margin, does it also equate to your profit margin in that? Are they, yes. th- okay, that's good then. Cause mm-hmm. sometimes the expenses will really eat into that margin as well. Right. Exactly. And I think jewelry has that kind of a hard, high margin because when you think about it, the majority of the industry is a sentimental purchase. It's an engagement ring. It's a wedding ring. It's a one-time you know, Mm. thousand percent markup. Um, So that's why it varies a lot depending on what you're doing. But also, you know, for someone who sells non-sterling silver, where it's a mixed metal, you can have a ring made for a dollar 20 and sell it for $30. Wow. 
You know, so if you're you willing to do the work, hello. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so in addition to that, I know one of the biggest pain points that business owners have is inventory management. Because yes. once now you had priced appropriately, people were more comfortable purchasing from you. How do you then keep the right items in stock? Because now we also have the additional layer of supply chain issues right. and shipping containers. <laughs> I'm, li- I'm literally looking at shipping containers parked on the water in yeah. front of me. Right? right. And that's an issue. So how do you keep the right level of stock? That is, I think, the thing everyone is having the same problem with, Mm -hmm. it's an impossible situation in reality because especially with social media, you never know what's going to be the thing that just jumps off the board. Mm -hmm. There are many times where I've got a whole run of jewelry and I'm like, this is going to sell out crazy. It's going to go crazy. Nothing. I sell like three, right? But then I sold three. I tell my, I tell my manufacturer, look, it's been four months. Like it's not moving. Let's, um, cause we have kind of like a revolving like line sheet that they will ask me like every quarter, like, what do you want from that? So mm-hmm. I was like, let's just take it off the, I'm not going to make it again. And then one day some influencer just buys it. I have no clue. And now they're just gone. They're just selling night and day. And it, ha- it just happens out of nowhere. Like, how do you prepare? And mm-hmm. sometimes you can't. Sometimes the best thing you can do is just actively watch your inventory flow bi-weekly. And I think as an owner, it's very important. It's very important that even if you are not shipping yourself to look on your back end every single day and just see what's moving in your store. Mm-hmm. Because I'll tell you from personal experience, it's the most, the most difficult thing is the inventory. It is. Mm-hmm. My manufacturer is a 30 days out from my reorder. So that means mm-hmm. if something sells out, I have 30 days until. Yeah. So you have to anticipate. Mm-hmm. Yes. You have to anticipate demand, but it's really something that I would say, watch your inventory, see what's starting to move up. Look at the months past. So a good example is if you have a bestseller and April, you sold 10. In May, you sold 15. Unless it's last year, let's say June, you sold 24. Maybe that's something, even if it's small movements, to make sure you're paying attention to because you're going to need more of those because Mm -hmm. that item is becoming a trend and a staple in your store. Mm. Stuff like that. Okay. I, I just found a inventory management software today. I have not tried it, but I've heard a good recommendation from a friend I know who owns a $10 million a year business. And it's called Cog Z C O G S Y. I will be mm-hmm. downloading that tonight. Give it's it an try. AI software that essentially downloads your data and projects based on your conversion rate and Mm -hmm. your traffic projections and your past sales and Google search, what Mm -hmm. items will be moving up again. It sounds again, too good to be true, but I'm going to technology is advancing rapidly. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I'd like to hear how that one works out, but right now, are you using Shopify? Did you build custom? And why did you decide to go that route as opposed to say an Etsy or a lot of the other marketplaces? So I do Shopify because I like the fact that I can control the data. I like the fact that I can actively see how many people added to their cart, what they added to their cart, Mm -hmm. what they went through with, they didn't went through with, how they even found my website. There's something called um, I believe a customer acquisition widget. Mm-hmm. It might be the wrong term, but it'll show you this. This customer visited your website four times. Um, between this time and this time, they clicked on these eight things. Mm. They added this to cart. You know, it, it'll show you everything on the back end, and then say it took the final. This email is what made them purchase. So then I can look on my back end and go, okay. 
a first time customer, it takes them eight times to visit my website to then make their first purchase. And my mm. average order is $110. So when I'm running ads, I need to keep in mind that my retargeting may take a bit longer than some, you know, than usual because mm -hmm. I know they have to see it eight times. Yeah. So I have Do to their be research, aware of make the up frequency. their mind. Yep. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I like Shopify because I like data. Etsy, you don't own that. That's their customer. Amazon, you don't own that. That's their customer. You are essentially, I got a great analogy for this. You're pretty much at a grocery store. You're not thinking about the cereal. You went to ShopRite. You went to Walmart. You mm -hmm. went to Target. You, that's their customer. You don't control the data. It's them. So you're just a box on the shelf when you're with Etsy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't get to see anything versus when you go to a specialty store for one thing they own all that information. Mm. Victoria's Secret can tell you how many people walked in, what they looked at, what they put down. They can tell, they can tell because they have the data. They can right. watch the cameras. They mm -hmm. own the store. It's very different. Mm -hmm. Plus, I know more recently, I've heard lots of complaints about the fees that are on some of these marketplaces. So yes, the Etsy fees were raised, um, I think two weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. So that also eats into your margins, right? So right. you may as well kind of spend the time and maybe the monthly fee to get something that in the right. long run will give you more revenue, just like you can attest yeah. to. But you said something about retargeting. And I know you and mm -hmm. I had taken the same Facebook ads class. So could right. you share how you used ads and influencers to fuel your growth? Of course. So... Influencers were a very much top of funnel aspect for me. And I like influencers because I use them to see what the life my customer wants. Everything on social media is fake. We know this, but that doesn't mean that we don't like it. Right. That doesn't mean that we don't buy into it. Mm -hmm. So when I have an influencer who I give them a special promo code, and in a month they sell four, they sell four things, mm. then I know, okay, people are buying into her aesthetic. And then when you have an influencer who converts, you can really see what festivals do they go to? Mm. What type of, like, what are they wasting their money on? Because half the time it's just them wasting their money. They're just yeah. traveling to some coffee shop in Paris just to say they went, you know, like, like what are they doing? <laughs> right, right. Right. You get to see what clothing brands they're wearing. You get to kind of see like how often they change their hair, what they're doing. And the reality is everyone's not an influencer, but that doesn't mean that we don't all aspire to certain mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. So when you have influencers, you can take their data from their feed. And when I say data, I mean, collecting all of that information I just spoke about, about where they go, how they eat, what they do. And then when you go into ads, you can begin building profiles on the ads through what those influencers who are converting for you are doing. Mm. And that's a nice way to kind of get a lot of the detailed marketing, which is a target audience, mm -hmm. a Facebook term. Mm -hmm and to then find other followers and other people who would also engage in your brand. Retargeting, the way I do it is if you visit my website and don't add to cart, here's a special ad for you based on that experience. Mm. If you add it to cart but didn't purchase, here's a different ad for you mm -hmm. because you're more engaged than that person. So I'm going to show you something different. Right. If you have purchased, in the past, but haven't purchased in the last 60 days, I'm going to show you a different ad because mm. you're a different kind of customer. To entice you to come back. Yeah. Yep. So um, I prefer ads in the bottom of funnel, which bottom of funnel means people who already know you, people who already have seen you or engaged with you because it's a lower entry level, especially when I was getting started mm -hmm. because you already have an audience. I started ads after I was already making 10,000 a month. So I already had a lot of 
customers that mm-hmm. I could get back in front of. And I think at the time my Instagram was 20,000 mm-hmm. followers maybe. And that's key because if mm-hmm. you're running ads, but no one knows about you and you yourself don't even know who your customer is, that's right. just a recipe for ra- wasting your money. And you could waste your money fast yeah. on Facebook, waste it really fast. So I, I don't think it's, it's not impossible to start from scratch on Facebook ads, but you really have to have a great understanding of who your customer mm-hmm. is to, to start cold mm-hmm. and just jump into that. And also you kind of need a little bit more bang for your buck. Um, I know a lot of, you know, YouTube teachers are like, you can just do $5 a day. And you can, but you can't. Five dollars a day is more about you having a strong idea of who your customer is and what your offer is. And nine times out of ten, if you listen to me talk about it, you probably don't, right? Mm -hmm. So it's probably best that you go to an influencer so you can put a face to a name and aesthetic to a name. And then once you start getting traffic, then you can build audiences on Facebook that look like your customers and Mm -hmm. Facebook will find people that resemble the same actions as past purchasers. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's probably a better way in my mind of how to start because a lot of influencers will do it for free. Mm. If you have a great product, they'll just, just in exchange for a product, they'll share it with their audience. So exactly. You mentioned Facebook ads and how how important it's been for your growth. How were you impacted by a lot of the privacy changes that have been made and will be made as well? Mm -hmm. So much. I can't even explain. I can't even explain how much that has impacted, not necessarily the ads, just the price of them. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, It's just more of, it's kind of the example of, Okay, if you have to, if your tub is backed up and Mm. it used to have a huge bucket and now you have a paper cup, it's just like, it's just going to take way more time. It's just way more money. And that's just what it is. It's not impossible. It still makes money. It still does very well for me. It's just, you have to be a lot more open to testing Mm. in a way that, can cost, <laughs> can cost yeah. you. Because you, you know, don't have as much, all the detail targeting you were mentioning, we don't have as yeah. much access to people's behavior right. online, especially right. if you have turned on the setting, don't track me, right? So, right. Mm-hmm. exactly, exactly. And it's not that it's a bad thing. I feel like it's just, you know, um, all of business is adjusting to what's happening. And I think the biggest thing is that you need to just be aware even if it's working well today, it may, it's not going to work the same way next year. Mm -hmm. It's just what it is. The world is changing. Yeah. All the time. Mm. And in a way, almost too damn fast. Mm. Right. Yeah. Like for even for me now, I'm learning TikTok ads and getting those up and Pinterest ads and getting Mm -hmm. those up. So it's not that Facebook is dead. I see a lot of people saying that nonsense. Facebook still makes a lot of money. Yeah. That's for me. (laughs) Yes. It's just a little bit more difficult to, um, to convert the same way because I'll have people who have purchased with me who are active and because of their phone settings, they'll even, they'll message me and be like, Hey, I haven't seen you post in forever. Mm. And it's just, the privacy measures now it has nothing to do with me or my brand or it's just how facebook isn't allowed to just stalk you in the way that they used to right and i would say as a private citizen i love that but as a business owner i don't love that so right it's a balance right yeah i mean me as a private citizen i personally don't mind as much Mm. only because I'm very much an introvert. I don't go outside. I'm not doing anything. Facebook showed me a lot of stuff I would never buy. I would never see. I always Mm. had really good recommendations. And I didn't often get 
scammed through um, the platform. Mm-hmm. I maybe because I'm an owner, I know how to look at a website and tell if it's drop shipping or not. Right. Mm-hmm. But it didn't bother me that much when it came to the ads. There are other tracking things I don't appreciate, like watching webcams and all types of crazy mm-hmm. stuff like that. So I'm into the privacy in that regard. But I don't like how it also my whole Instagram feed is the same six people. Yeah. I don't like that. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I'm yeah. always trying to figure out. Where is everyone you know, else? I, I can't wh- see What's anything. going on? <laughs> I follow a thousand people. Mm-hmm. And I see six of you. Right. And one of the six is my boyfriend. I'm right. like, okay, <laughs> I live with you. I need to see you every day. Yeah. So, you know, well, there's levels you, to it. It sounds like you're juggling a lot. And I'm curious, Mm. who do you have helping you, especially now that you say you're, you're building out presence on different platforms. Um, And how does that differ from who you started out with when you were working part-time and decided to go full-time? Well, I work by myself. Um, It's just me. Mm. No, my mother helps a lot, but she Mm. handles the shipping and the customer service on the email. Mm -hmm. Um, and I do have a few people who help every now and then on the customer service for the Instagram, but I've had very bad experiences trying to outsource what I do. Mm. It's it's never worked in my favor at all. I've lost a lot of money trying to have people, you know, run ads for me or do my email marketing, or I've had very, very bad experiences Mm -hmm. where I've lost a ton of revenue. So that part is a little bit difficult. I'm still trying to figure out how to navigate in terms of growth. Cause Mm -hmm. I, my goal for next year is to hit that million. So I really need to figure out this year. What are the things that I can't not do myself? Mm -hmm. And what are the things that I can teach someone to do for me Mm. if I'm watching them until they really get it. Right. But it's, it's impossible because all the help I need is so nuanced. It's so, it's, it's so specific. I don't Mm. need help back, um, boxing anything. I need help with someone who understands the Clavio email platform and knows how to sync my emails to my ads and then read the campaigns. It's, it's like such a nuanced, Mm -hmm. um, section is much difficult. So in my plan, I will eventually find some very great people that I can teach my way of scaling. Mm -hmm. So that way it's still me doing it, but it's just them doing it for me. But at the moment, it's like, that's actually the hardest thing I've Mm -hmm. come across. Mm -hmm. So what's next for you? Are you planning on staying within the bounds of the jewelry you have? Or can we expect some more products from you in the near future? I have a few things in the works. Okay. (laughs) Um, I So yes, the jewelry. I'm going to reach into men's. I've been having a lot of men who love my stuff, especially Mm -hmm. because a lot of my jewelry is men's jewelry. I just make it women's sizes because (laughs) why not? You know? Good to know. Yeah. My little brother has all of my jewelry and all his friends. It's actually hilarious because I just never foreseen men wearing kitten, you know, Mm -hmm. but is it still going to be called kitten for the men? I see. That's where I'm trying to figure out because a lot of guys don't seem to care. They're just like, I I want my chain. Mm -hmm. They don't really seem to care at all. And they tag kitten co. I've been trying to consider maybe thinking of a separate name to run for them, but uh, I yeah, have no idea. It will take a little I bit know. of thinking to figure that out, but I'm excited to see what you do next because if the, the past few years are any indication, there's just even more wonderful things coming for you. But for Thank anyone you. listening to this who wants to follow your journey and support, where can we find you? So you can find me at Kitten Co. Jewelry on Instagram, on TikTok, YouTube will be coming soon. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I'm also, I will be opening a blog to help answer a few questions for other entrepreneurs. I'm also starting a nonprofit. So if anyone is interested in 
maybe you have a specialty and you want to co-teach a class or have any, like, I'm looking for people who maybe you have a budgeting thing that you can, we could do a quick little class on Mm. for the nonprofit section of my business or a finance section, or just, or you have a side hustle where you crochet, you know, anything Mm -hmm. that can kind of help me kickstart that because I have a lot of people in my DMs all day, every day asking what you're asking me right now. Mm-hmm. And I'm only one person. Yeah. You don't have the the bandwidth to it. run a business and teach. Can't, right. Mm-hmm. Can't do it. Yep. So you could find me at Kit and Co Jewelry on honestly, almost any platform. I'm pretty active on even Pinterest. I'm pretty active on everything me, myself, and I. Wow. If you enjoyed this conversation with Maya, I want you to know we have over 160 audio episodes that you can binge listen to on she'soffscript.com or anywhere else audio episodes are available. Before you head out, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss our next episode. All right, we'll see you right back here next Thursday for another episode. Bye.